Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 412. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Archbishop Greg Venables, Primate of South America, Bishop of Argentina, and it's Tuesday the 26th of June 2018. All right, welcome to a special edition of Unscripted. I have Archbishop Venables, um, and it's going to be great to talk a little bit kind of debrief each other on GAFCON because you were behind the scenes and I was behind the camera and a lot happens between what I see and, and what you got to participate in. Um, first, how was your trip back and how was the jet lag doing? It was uh, a long trip back by Istanbul and Brazil, but Sylvia lay down in bed when we got here and slept without moving for the best part of 11 hours, which was good. So we're back, we're back Turkey now. That's good, because uh, w without the, the grace of, of God's gift of coffee, uh, we probably won't be talking right now, because I just woke up after my 15-hour uh, uh, stupor as well. But I had a really good time. Um, GAFCON is a growing, amazing entity within the church. And I don't think anybody on either side really has an idea of what it's becoming. Uh, I think... When I see GAFCON right now, it's very mature, and it may just happen to be the leading um, authority within the church all by itself. Now, people will ar argue, Kevin, that can't be. It's not an instrument and stuff like that. Well, I'm here to talk to the Archbishop Venables uh, about some of these things. Um, you've seen the change from GAFCON 1, 2, and now 3, and how GAFCON uh, reacts to situations, it's more mature. Uh, tell me what you see. Well, as you know, I'm one of the fathers of the GAFCON movement, right, going back all those years. I was very much a part of it all beginning. And then I stepped to one side and handed over the primacy to a colleague. And then people started insisting I come back in and that came as a surprise to me. I believe you and I chatted about sure. it at the time, Kevin. And I prayed a lot, and I just knew God wanted me to come back in. And now I can see why. Because I had certain reservations, even though I agree fully with what Gafgon stands for, and the whole principle on which it works, and the reason why it's working. But coming back in and having been through this time recently in, uh, in Jerusalem, I am more convinced than ever that God is present in the GAFCON movement and that it is standing in the place it needs to stand and speaking in the way it needs to speak in order that God's will can be heard clearly at a very difficult time in the history of the church. So I'm very, very, very positive about it all. I'm very glad that God has given me the opportunity to see it close up and to be a part of it. All right, let's talk about seeing it close up. Um, you were in Jerusalem. You got to work with the primates and, and others as um, GAFCON is maturing. I, was I, I noticed most the reaction to those who were not there. Obviously, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the AC uh, and the Communion Office, um, they were a bit troubled by what was happening in Jerusalem. And I, I kind of detected a bit of fear. You remember GAFCON 1, we had a video from Roland Williams. GAFCON 2, Justin Wilby uh, decided to show up and uh, address the uh, delegates. Here, there was, oh, don't bother with GAFCON, they're just a ginger group. Uh, you really don't need to go. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, Furon wrote a letter saying, you probably shouldn't go if you want my respect. Um, this is a little different response than we should have expected from Canterbury. Well, I think that they are seeing very clearly that the vast majority of Anglicans, and especially the Anglic Anglican leadership, is meeting together in Gafcon. There were far more significant people present this time. So I think it's right that people react to it. What saddens us enormously is that they are afraid. What one would like to think, if this were a loving disagreement, and if there really were a, a desire for reconciliation, 
that they would respond to this incredible significant phenomenon and say, well, talk to us, tell us what we need to do so that we can come to a loving disagreement, so that we can reconcile. If my family and my wife suddenly said, sorry, we can't be with you anymore, I wouldn't get suddenly self-righteous and, and start saying nasty things about them. I would be immediately in touch and say, well, tell me what we need to do. And the deafening silence says everything. This is a group of people who've made a decision and they know or at least suspect they're wrong and they're doing what we all do when we know we're wrong. Instead of asking for correction, they're reacting in fear and negatively and that's behind the deafening silence. And that's really sad because we care about our colleagues in the Anglican Communion. But I've been through, as you know, Kevin, all the meetings. I've been wearing a purple shirt for 25 years now. I've been in every significant Anglican gathering. Gafcon is exactly how Anglicans should be. Biblical, clear, and loving. And therefore, if there is that sort of reaction, then we need to be very sad for those people. But how we open dialogue is difficult to know because all we're getting is, as I say, this stone wall. Uh, no, I, I agreed. And uh, you and I have sp uh, spoke during and after many of these meetings um, in Alexandria. Uh, you were completely disappointed with um, how Rowan had uh, uh, grabbed the agenda. Uh, and uh, you were excited by uh, other meetings where um, the majority of the primates have the agenda and could hold the Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church um, and others accountable. You, and I think sometime Friday, uh, Canterbury woke up and said, or, or thought to themselves, more people are willing to pay to go to GAFCON than willing to get a free ride to Lambeth. And I think that's where the fear is, um, the excitement around GAFCON. Now, there's detractors, there's those people out there who say, well, you're just schismatics. How dare you uh, walk away and leave the, 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 the origins of our church behind? But that's really not what's happening, is it? Not at all. We're not the schismatics. We are just standing and standing firm together. Sadly, some members of what we thought was the family have walked away, have refused to talk, have refused to listen, and are, are just obviously going down a road which will lead them, I'm sorry to say, away from truth, and even worse, away from God. And that's very, very worrying, and I think we're all really concerned to be praying for people who are acting in such a foolish way. Help me distinguish um, English or the Brits have a culture. Um, you will never know when you've been insulted by a, a, a per person with a British accent because they do it so eloquently. Uh, ginger groups. Well, well, what's a ginger group? You know, and there's, there's a confusion about you know, kind of the culture. Can you help me distinguish well-be from Anglicanism, um, from the communion? I think, first of all, the Archbishop of Canterbury is trying to do something he has not been called to be or called to do. He's trying to be the referee. And in Anglicanism, the Archbishop of Canterbury isn't the referee. He's a senior leader, the first among equals, and he's a player. The referee is God himself sharing his thoughts through the body of the church meeting together. And what Justin should try to do is to gather everybody together, allow everybody to talk so that we can come to that place. Now, the primates did something like that in January 2016. And there was an enormous effort to get everybody together. And the church spoke clearly. And then nothing happened. And that is the most worrying thing of all. Because if I met with all my family 
with my wife and my three children and their partners and the seven grandchildren and we all expressed an opinion and then I walked away and did nothing about it. You would have to ask seriously, well, what is your role as father in the family? What is your role as the senior member present? Not as the referee, but the one who is expected to make sure that the family purpose is fulfilled. So I think that is extremely worrying. Also, the deafening silence from my colleagues in the British or English Episcopacy. I know them personally. And I ask myself, well, these are days of communication. Anybody can speak to anybody at any moment simply, WhatsApp, Skype, or any other method of communication. So why the deafening silence? Why do people not get in touch and say, well, what's happening? What do you think I should do? Which is what we would normally do as rational and especially caring people in a situation which is troubling everywhere. All that I can see is people on the other side of a wall throwing bricks and turning their back. One of the remarkable things about GAFCON, too, was the decision to um, not go after England, but to you know put a branch of uh, GAFCON there to allow for an, an alternative. Uh, certainly, there are, and I've spoken to many English bishops who are willing to stay and work within the system, some who are very uncomfortable with the system, and some who can't wait to leave. They were looking for an alternative. Uh, now with the uh, uh, AMI uh, E, they have that altern that they have that alternative. Um, do you think something like that can really take off in England? I'm rather sad that it's not really going to go anywhere because people have got this idea that they don't want to relate to it, and the only reason I can imagine that that might be is they don't want to lose status and they don't want to be rock the boat mm -hmm. they don't want to be at odds with the other colleagues because there is a great practice historically in britain if somebody rocks the boat you blackball them you you simply treat them or send them to coventry and nobody wants that and that's what is governing the whole system. It's being used in, I would almost say, maybe I will say, a bullying way of keeping things in place. People have said, not to me directly, but to other people, but Gafcon is toxic. Who said that? Gafcon is a Christian, biblical movement full of lovely, decent, good leadership. Where does that word come from? I remember being interviewed by the BBC during when, when the Jim Robinson thing was all going on. And I was actually asked, well, why do you want to associate with those people? Well, I'm quite happy to say I associate with them, if we're talking now about GAFCOM, because they're my brothers and sisters, and they're the ones who are standing together and speaking out as God wants them and us to do. So I find it extremely sad, but not surprising. Because I know very well from personal experience, if I'm going down the wrong road, I get very cross when people point it out to me. Uh, the ACNA and uh, GAFCON uh, owe a little bit of their success to uh, characters like Catherine Jeffert Shorey, the former presiding bishop here in the Episcopal Church. I think the success of GAFCON 3, 4, 5, and on down the line in its growth is going to be the catalyst of uh, uh, Archbishop Justin Welby. And I see this like his invitation of uh, presiding Bishop Michael Curry to the wedding to, to give the, uh, this address, the Sermon of Love. Um, I had spoken to uh, primates, archbishops, who are you know, on the, the fence between whether to go with Canterbury or Gafcon, and they're like, okay, Gafcon is the future. Uh, Canterbury has chosen the side of liberal Anglicanism, liberal Christianity, and I can't go there. Now, I, I've not heard this at the bishop level, but some of the archbishops who uh, did not attend uh, GAFCON 
have purported to you know now be off the fence. They're, they're starting to choose sides. And the catalyst was the imitation of Michael Curry. Have you seen stuff like this? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because what's happened, and that's one of the things that we, we see as having been decided, is just making the thing even more clear. When you are challenged about a basic issue of Christian ethics, and you respond by saying, you know I can't answer that, then everybody immediately knows where we are. And you do it publicly. So in a sense, the word catalyst is the correct word. And this is helping people to say, well, now I know where everything is, now I know where things stand, and I know where I have to be. I think it's very clear that when you get off the right road, anybody who's got a map just has to think, well, this is going wrong and I need to think how I can get back en route. And so that is positive in a rather sad way, of course. Mm. Archbishop Foley Beach and Archbishop Benjamin Kwashi are the new leaders of GAFCON. That's, that's a pretty bold uh, uh, choice for the primates. It's a good choice. First of all, Foley's place now in a few months' time, taking over, says exactly how things are. It says that we believe that there was a very serious mistake made when ACNA was marginalised. And we're just saying, no, that was a mistake, and we have got to put that right. And Ben Kwashi coming in as General Secretary is another way of saying that he is a part of the vast majority of Bible-believing, born-again Anglican Christians who just are saying we have to keep this going in the right direction. And I think it's great. I was a part of the meeting when we as the uh, Gatcom Primates Council took that decision. And all we needed to do was pray and look around the table and the decision was made. And it just points clearly in what God is telling us and how we are seeking to be moving down the right road. And those who can see it clearly and who have made the right decision just need to say, well, we're with you. We're with you. And those that sadly don't want to make that decision will also have things clear to be able to make their decision. But they need to ask seriously Where's the alternative going? Where is it going to end up? Once you go down the road of heresy and pluralism and relativism, once you start introducing non-truth into doctrine, well, I've said it before, once you mix non-truth with truth, you just end up with more non-truth. That's true. And very, very, very sad. Mm. Archbishop, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, you've been very generous with Anglican TV in the past, and uh, I'd like to let the viewers know that you've agreed to do future interviews with us, and we're going to be sending you a new microphone and some uh, equipment so that you can uh, join us on a more frequent basis. Um, I noticed that uh, Skype has been generous to us too. Sometimes I call you all the way down in South America. You're a little bit pixelated, and the audio and the video is not always uh, mashed up well. So I, I, I look forward to more, more talks with you, Archbishop. And let me just say to those who are watching us, please put a like on everything that Anglican TV does or whatever else you need to do to support it. And be generous because Anglican TV and my dear brother Kevin are among those who are serving God faithfully in this difficult moment in the history of the church. And it's a way everybody out there can get to hear the truth and to know what really is happening, not just an opinion, but an objective view of reality so that people can make their decision. Thank you, Kevin. God bless you and God bless your ministry. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Archbishop Greg Venables. And you've been watching episode, oh, I wrote it down here somewhere, 412 of Anglican Unscripted.